Critical Pedagogy, a Theory of Liberation. As we delve into an exploration of critical pedagogy and its tenets, we begin with a brief bio of Paulo Freire. Paulo Freire was born in Northeast Brazil in 1921. As a young child, his experiences with poverty forced him to acknowledge the relationship between social class, knowledge, and education. He lived among poor rural families and laborers where he gained a deep appreciation and respect for their lives and the effects of social economics on education. In 1947, he began work with adults who could not read in Northeast Brazil, and he developed a method of teaching, in other words, a pedagogy, with which the word conscientization has been associated, and we will learn more about that in a moment. Freire's teaching method, or pedagogy, involves being one with the community, speaking with the people on deep levels, and gaining an understanding of the words that impacted their realities and their daily lives. Once he was able to begin to understand the social reality of his students, he began the process of conscientization in which students began to critically examine the social factors that impacted their lives and their oppression. In 1962, Freire taught 300 farm workers to read and write in just 45 days. And as a result, he gained governmental approval for thousands of cultural circles to be set up all over Brazil, utilizing his method of teaching. However, a military coup in 1964 halted the work and it changed his life, but it led to the development of one of his pinnacle works, Pedagogy of the Oppressed. The formation of critical consciousness allows students to question the nature of their historical and social situation, which Freire called reading the world with the goal of becoming subjects in the creation of a democratic society. Freire believed in the power of the students. And as you can see in the quote, education does not change the world. Education changes people and people change the world. He was committed to dialogue with his students and to being on the same level with them as they were both learning both questioning and reflecting and making meaning of the situations that they confronted in their classrooms. Freire's teaching philosophy and pedagogy is best explained in his seminal work, Pedagogy of the Oppressed, which is an international text used by educators to help guide students through an understanding of oppressive societies and how to overcome them through education. We will now move into a definition of critical terminologies. We begin with critical pedagogy. Critical pedagogy is a method of teaching that facilitates the serious critique of social process and social issues that have happened historically and contemporarily, it views students as a legitimate source of knowledge. It creates a classroom community that disrupts the power dynamics of teachers over students. It is dedicated to the eradication of social inequities, including racism, sexism, poverty, heterosexism, and religious intolerance and it emphasizes civic action and transformation. The principles, aims, and approaches of critical pedagogy are as follows. Principles, knowledge should relate to and develop from the lived experience of participants or students. Knowledge should be co-created between all participants in the learning process. 
and education is inherently political. Aims to become aware of one's own and others' oppressions, to make connections between personal experiences and wider societal forces, and to develop critical thinkers who are able to create new knowledge. Approaches to co-create a flexible curriculum using authentic materials, generative themes, and finding teachable moments. To cultivate hope and symbolic resistance, and to pursue democracy and equality in learning environments. And I would like for you to pause for a moment and consider how our ethnic studies course has as its goals all three of these critical elements. Which ones of these elements can you identify as taking place in our course this semester? Education as the exercise of domination stimulates the credulity of students with the ideological intent, often not perceived by educators, of indoctrinating them to adapt to the world of oppression. In other words, education is often used as an oppressive system in which students are expected to just accept the information that's given to them without critically analyzing or questioning whether or not that information is factual or based in accuracy. With the intent, even though the teachers may not consciously understand this, of brainwashing or indoctrinating students to accept history in a very biased way or to accept the fact that the reason why their people are minoritized or marginalized or oppressed is just the way that the world is and a necessary part of history. Critical pedagogy supports the belief that education is never neutral. In other words, pedagogy or teaching always makes a choice to either transmit knowledge and values that support and perpetuate the status quo. In other words, the way that the world is, the way that the nation is in terms of its systems of education, of justice, of health care, in terms of politics and culture, etc., or education chooses to challenge and dismantle those systems that exist because of the embedded racism, inequities, and injustice within them. Not taking a stand does not equal being neutral. It equals conforming to the ways and the ideas dominant to the societal context. In other words, education and educators that does not recognize that the systems that we live in are unjust and inequitable, just by virtue of being neutral, actually end up siding with the status quo and perpetuating the injustices that have existed and that will continue to exist. Freire stated, the educator has the duty of not being neutral. In other words, we have to choose to either side with the dismantling of inequity or being a perpetuator of oppression and injustice. As we explore various quotes by Paula Freire in this presentation, I ask that you take a moment to pause after you hear each quote and reflect upon how that quote connects to your own life and your own educational experiences or the educational experiences of oppressed groups of students and people in our country and world. And also connect these quotes to the information that we have learned and are learning in our ethnic studies course. Washing one's hands of the conflict between the powerful and the powerless means to side with the powerful, not to be neutral. Pause, connect, reflect. In what ways, if any, 
might you have felt indoctrinated by your experiences in education thus far? Which teachers, if any, can you remember who have challenged the status quo? In what ways did she, he, or they do so? What are the challenges that exist for educators and institutions and students for that matter who aren't neutral? Why might they face those challenges and how can they circumvent them? In what ways does this ethnic studies course reflect and integrate the elements of critical pedagogy? We will now explore some of the key tenets of pedagogy of the oppressed and critical pedagogy. And we will begin with the banking concept of education. The banking concept of education is the notion that knowledge is a gift bestowed by those who consider themselves knowledgeable upon those whom they consider to know nothing. And let's check out this graphic right here, which exemplifies a visual representation of the banking concept. We see a teacher with bags of information and a funnel pouring the information into a student's open brain. The banking concept means that there are educators who do believe that their students are empty vessels who come to their classrooms ready to be filled with information. And this is detrimental because it refutes the fact that these students come to the class with lived experiences and knowledge that serves as the basis for their understanding of the world. They are not simply empty vessels ready to be filled with information. And too many educators fail to draw upon the intelligence and the knowledge that students already bring with them into the classroom. Freire wrote, it is not surprising that the banking concept of education regards men as adaptable, manageable beings. Implicit in the banking concept is the assumption of a dichotomy between human beings and the world. A person is merely in the world, not with the world or with others. The individual is a spectator, not a recreator. And this relates to students in education because Freire firmly believed that students are active agents in the world. And that as active agents, they are not merely to sit and watch things happen to them, but they should be taking charge of the situations that impact them in the world. And they should be actively understanding the circumstances which created an unjust society and creating ideas and actions to change that injustice. As Freire writes, why not establish an intimate connection between knowledge considered basic to any school curriculum and knowledge that is the fruit and lived experience of these students as individuals? And in this very interesting graphic representation of the banking concept, if we read the words, they're a little bit uh, blurry but we see at the top, oppressor, meaning the media, politics, corporations, elites, etc., as the bearers of true knowledge. And we see the educator or the teacher in orangey kind of color with a fishbowl on his head, pouring an orange liquid into the uh, fishbowls on top of their students' heads to kind of submerge them in this orange liquid, right? And uh, it says he is depositing and communicating slogans or undeniable truths um, 
that are defined as reality into the students' heads. And you see the students quote, if it is not orange, it is not real. So this is an example of, uh, an exaggerated example of the indoctrination of um, education. Here is another representation of the banking concept. And uh, what do we see happening in this image? I paused for a moment so you could take it in, but obviously we see a row of students who have different shapes of thoughts, yet what is the teacher doing? The teacher has her own thought that's represented by little square or rectangle, and she's taking students' thoughts and matching them exactly to the shape of her own thoughts, right? So it is the uh, transformation of individual thoughts to the thoughts that match that of the educator and the stifling of different opinion, different perspective, different worldview, um, different ideas that students come to their courses in their classrooms with. And here is yet another image that is a variation of the representation of the banking concept of, of standardized tests. So you see these poor children who are hooked up to these devices on their brains that are pouring information into their skulls and they have these, uh, what are they, blinders on the sides of their faces so they can't see anything other than what's in front of them. And a teacher with the quote saying, come away from the window. You don't want to be a child left behind, do you? And the little girl who's desperate to get out of there, who sees through the window the bird with the banner flying that says the arts and PE and sunshine and nature and science uh, that you see written into the mountains, right? And that girl wants to get out of there, right? So this is the escape from the banking concept of education. The teacher is, of course, an artist. But being an artist does not mean that he or she can make the profile or can shape the students. What the educator does in teaching is to make it possible for the students to become themselves. So Freire was obviously critical of the banking model in which learners or students are viewed as empty, inferior, or passive recipients of a teacher's knowledge. He argued that this approach discouraged critical thinking and dehumanized both the student and the teacher. So he advocated for problem-posing education, fueled by dialogue or discussions in which Students or learners are agentic, meaning they have the power to control their own goals, actions, and destinies. Learning takes place through problem solving. Learning should be both theoretical and practical. Teachers should not be the authoritative distributors of knowledge in classrooms. New possibilities emerge when students and teachers share information and learn together, and that learning is an endless process of becoming. Various banking education anesthetizes and inhibits creative power. Problem-posing education involves a constant unveiling of reality. Banking education attempts to maintain the submersion of consciousness. Problem-posing education strives for the emergence of consciousness and critical intervention in reality. Pause, connect, and reflect. Identify specific examples of the ways that schools are typically dependent on banking. How does that particularly impact students of color? How does that impact students in general? Have you personally experienced an educational environment where banking was taking place or where you felt your ability to think critically was denied or hampered? How did it make you feel? 
Did you do anything about it? How does or how might an educational environment in which the educator sees herself or himself as equal to the students and in which the students are welcome and expected to share their knowledge impact learning? Conscientization, conscientization, critical consciousness. Conscientization, critical consciousness, or conscientization in Portuguese, is a popular education and social concept developed by Freire, which is grounded in post-Marxist critical theory. Critical consciousness focuses on achieving an in-depth understanding of the world, which allows for the perception and exposure of social and political contradictions. Critical consciousness also includes taking action against the oppressive elements in one's life that are illuminated by that understanding. Conscientization is the process of developing a critical awareness of one's social reality through reflection and action. Action is fundamental because it is the process of changing the reality. Freire says that we all acquire social myths which have a dominant tendency. And so learning is a critical process which depends upon uncovering real problems and actual needs and dismantling the social myths that impact us negatively. Critical consciousness is the ability to assess the political and social structures that exist and to empower students to question authority and speak out against injustices. Conscientización also refers to learning to perceive social, political, and economic contradictions and to take action against the oppressive elements of reality. Critical consciousness means going beneath surface meanings, first impressions, dominant myths, official pronouncements, traditional cliches, received wisdom, to understand the deep meanings, root causes, social context, ideologies, and personal consequences of any topic. It is the ability to recognize and analyze systems of inequality and the commitment to take action against these systems. And it can be a gateway to academic motivation and achievement for marginalized students. It is absolutely essential that the oppressed participate in the revolutionary process with an increasingly critical awareness of their role as subjects of the transformation. Pause, connect, and reflect. Why is critical consciousness especially important for students of color or marginalized students? Why do you think it's typically hard to find teachers and courses which promote critical consciousness? Do you consider yourself critically conscious? In what ways have you developed your own personal critical consciousness? When and how did you begin to develop it? Which educational courses, if any, can you identify that have helped you develop critical consciousness? How did those courses impact you and your life? If you've not had any courses that influence critical consciousness, how has that impacted you? Have you ever used your agency to take action against injustice in your community, in your society, in your nation or world? In what ways? And in what specific ways does the content of this ethnic studies course promote critical consciousness? Dialogue. Freire asserted the importance of dialogue or talking in the classroom. Students must be able to talk with each other 
They must be able to talk with their teacher. And they must be able to ask questions about the world and about the content as they explore new topics and subjects and as they grow as learners. Freire wrote, any situation in which some individuals prevent others from engaging in the process of inquiry or asking questions is one of violence. The means used are not important. To alienate human beings from their own decision making is to change them into objects. And this again affirms Freire's belief that students must be able to take control of their own conscious development and processing of the information that they discover and explore in schools. When educators stifle students from asking questions, it is seen as a form of violence. Learning is a process where knowledge is presented to us then shaped through understanding, discussion, and reflection. To enter into dialogue presupposes equality amongst participants. Each must trust the others. There must be mutual respect and love, care and commitment. Each one must question what he or she knows and realize that through dialogue, existing thoughts will change and new knowledge will be created. If it is in speaking their word that people, by naming the world, transform it, dialogue imposes itself as the way by which they achieve significance as human beings. Leaders or teachers who do not act dialogically but insist on imposing their decisions do not organize the people, they manipulate them. They do not liberate, nor are they liberated. They oppress. If the structure does not permit dialogue, the structure must be changed. In other words, if an educational environment does not permit dialogue, then the educational system must be changed. This quote exemplifies Freire's belief that teachers must be on the same level as students, as partners in the educational journey. Through dialogue, the teacher of the students and the students of the teacher cease to exist and a new term emerges, teacher-student with students-teachers, which basically means that we all learn from each other. How can I dialogue if I always project ignorance onto others and I never perceive my own? How can I dialogue if I am close to and even offended by the contribution of others? At the point of encounter, there are neither yet ignoramuses nor perfect sages. There are only people who are attempting together to learn more than they now know. Some may think that to affirm dialogue, the encounter of women and men in the world in order to transform the world is naively and subjectively idealistic. There is nothing, however, more real or concrete than people in the world and with the world than humans with other humans. The oppressor's tranquility rests on how well people fit the world the oppressors have created and how little they question it. Praxis, action and reflection. While dialogue is imperative to critical pedagogy, it is not enough for people to come together in dialogue in order to gain knowledge of their social reality. 
They must act together upon their environment in order critically to reflect upon their reality and to so transform it through further action and critical reflection. This process includes theory, action, and reflection. This is a more detailed model of the cycle of critical praxis, which all students should have the opportunity to participate in. It begins with number one, the identification of a social problem. Number two, researching the background, the history, the data, and the facts of the problem and the people who that problem impacts. Number three is the development of a collective plan of action designed to address the problem. Four is the implementation of that collective plan of action. Five is the evaluation of the action after it has taken place, the assessment of its efficacy, and the re-examination of the state of the problem. Did the action solve the problem or is it still unsolved? And if it is still unsolved, then we go right back up to number one again and start the process over with a new plan of action to continue trying to drive at a solution. And this example of critical praxis has been implemented in classrooms to help students identify the process through which they can actually engage in social change and action. Praxis entails the ability to have an idea, to organize and sequence a motor plan, the actions, and execute them in a coordinated fashion in response to a novel environmental or social demand. Liberation is a praxis, the action and reflection of men and women upon their world in order to transform it. For apart from inquiry, apart from the praxis, individuals cannot be truly human. Knowledge emerges only through invention and reinvention, through the restless, impatient, continuing, hopeful inquiry human beings pursue in the world, with the world, and with each other. Pause, connect, and reflect. Have you ever been given the opportunity to participate in a praxis exercise? Explain. In what ways might participating in praxis projects help students and particularly marginalized students become more successful? How might it impact their community, nation, and world? Why do you think most schools refrain from promoting praxis projects? What is an example of a social issue or problem that you would consider engaging in praxis towards? Why is it important to you? What would be the desired result of that praxis exercise? Liberation. To liberate is to free someone or something from being controlled by another person or group, etc. Liberation is the process of freeing oneself. Freire wrote, education is freedom. Education will teach you how to do it yourself as opposed to asking someone else to do it for you. And this is what is our critical mission, to free ourselves and liberate ourselves through our own critical consciousness because we can't rely on someone or anyone else to give us our freedom for it is not for anyone to give to us. It is up to us to free ourselves. It would be extremely naive to expect the dominant classes to develop a type of education that would enable subordinate classes to perceive social injustices critically. And I want to take a moment to break down this quote because it drives at the heart 
of what critical pedagogy and pedagogy of the oppressed is trying to impart upon the world. It would be extremely naive to expect the dominant classes, the ruling classes, the Eurocentric order that governs the education system in the United States of America to develop the type of education that would truly create liberation or freedom for the subordinate classes. In other words, students of color. In other words, poor students. In other words, marginalized students. Because this country is built on inequity and it is built on the backs of those who are poor. And this country needs to keep those different classes separated in order to exist. So how could we expect change or educational change in a country that is so embedded in racism and injustice and in discrimination? How can we truly expect the United States education system to create courses in which students are taught to look at history and contemporary circumstances with a critical mind? That's why ethnic studies is so important. That's why any course that implements and integrates critical pedagogy is so important so that we can begin to change the structure. And that change has to start from the students. For cultural invasion to succeed, it is essential that those invaded become convinced of their intrinsic inferiority. The oppressed, having internalized the image of the oppressor and adopted his guidelines, are fearful of freedom. And let's dissect this statement. The notion that because we have been oppressed for so long, for so many centuries, have we been under the rule of others, that we fear what freedom might actually feel like, what true liberation might look like, what it might be like. And therefore, that fear keeps us trapped into the system that we are already under. And this is why it is so critical that we explore notions of liberation and change and that we become the agents of that change to create this new reality. No pedagogy which is truly liberating can remain distant from the oppressed by treating them as unfortunates and by presenting for their emulation models from among the oppressors. The oppressed must be their own example in the struggle for their redemption. Authentic liberation, the process of humanization, is not another deposit to be made in men. Liberation is a praxis the action and reflection of men and women upon their world in order to transform it. Those truly committed to the cause of liberation can accept neither the mechanistic concept of consciousness as an empty vessel to be filled, nor the use of banking methods of domination, propaganda, slogans, and deposits in the name of liberation. Attempting to liberate the oppressed without their reflective participation in the act of liberation is to treat them as objects that must be saved from a burning building. Freedom is acquired by conquest, not by gift. It must be pursued constantly and responsibly. Freedom is not an ideal located outside of man, nor is it an idea which becomes myth. It is rather the indispensable condition for the quest 
for human completion. For your final pause, connect, and reflect, what does liberation mean to you? Can you define it in your own words? In what specific ways might systems of education become foundations of liberation for students? What does liberation is not a gift to be bestowed or given to others mean to you? What does freedom is acquired by conquest mean to you? And how does ethnic studies promote liberation for students? In conclusion, I must note that what you have seen in this recording represents a very tiny portion of the totality of themes that are found in critical pedagogy and pedagogy of the oppressed. I highly encourage you to check out Pedagogy of the Oppressed and process it through your own lens in your own time so that you can gain a full understanding of the impact and the power of this incredible teaching methodology and pedagogy. For now, we will leave off with one last quote. Looking at the past must only be a means of understanding more clearly what and who you are so you can wisely build the future. We are forever thankful for Paulo Freire for his contribution to the world, Pedagogy of the Oppressed.